Um, it doesn't seem to work, um, which is annoying. But yeah. I was going to talk about Chase and Web Tokens. So let's just start without slides and we see where we get. Um, who here in the room has ever heard or used Chase and Web Tokens before? A lot of you? Okay, keep them up. Who's ever, who actually knows how Chase and Web Tokens work? Because a lot of people use them without actually knowing most of the details of how they work. Uh, and that's fine because you don't really need to know the details, but it's nice if you know how they work and, and, and what's, what's so special about them. Um, are you going to try to solve this or do I yes. just continue slightly? Yeah, yeah, well, if you, if <laughs> okay. you can provide some entertainment for a while. <laughs> I'll, I'll, just, I'll just start my presentation without slides and we'll see uh, if it makes some sense. If it doesn't make sense, we're a small group, just put up your hands and I'll try to answer the questions that are not obvious because we're missing slides. Um, so I was going to start by just explaining a bit about how authentication used to work in a traditional scenario. With a traditional application, I mean a web app um, that has been generated on the server. The pages are generated on the server. All the logic is handled on the server. All the authentication logic is handled on the server, uh, which means it's all in one place. And that, that server handles all the logic and then sends back an HTML page to the browser. Like we've all used this. If you want to access a protected page, uh, you need to log in, send your username and credentials to that server, they check it, if it's okay, you get your page back. Okay, <laughs> let's see if we can, no. <laughs> no. The thing is, I need to be able to get what's on this screen, on these screens, and for that I need to move my mouse, but that doesn't seem to work. Can you so, move the, the, the viewer display? Yes, that's what I'm trying to do. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but um, the thing is that the, the preference pane of mirroring my displays is on those screens, and yeah, that doesn't work. Oh, so, you have a huge resolution. <laughs> back to the traditional uh, okay, authentication. Your logic is on the, on the server, and gets it. sent back to the browser, browser renders your HTML page, but it usually also you know sets a session cookie, yeah, so just so you don't have to log in every time that. again and again and again, yeah. and yeah. it's a protected page, right? Think. A little bit slow. A little bit slow. Okay, I will try to speak a little bit slow. Like, you know, so, um, this, uh, you said a session cookie as well. Um, once you've authenticated for the first time and it has been successful, you want to just so you don't have to log in every time again and again. So next time you want to access something protected, you send a session cookie. If the session inside of this cookie is still valid, you get access to this protected page or resource without giving your credentials again. I think this is something we're all familiar with. I guess so. Um, but there's a few differences between a traditional application, or at least what I consider a traditional application, which is the server-generated ones, and single-page applications, which seem to be the bulk of all the new applications these days. These fancy JavaScript um, applications no, that we get from Angular View, which completely run in the browser. Um, so most of the logic also happens in the browser instead of on the back end. Um, and the first difference is that with the traditional applications, you usually have one origin, um, because your page gets rendered by your server, the browser connects to that server. It's one origin, so you can set cookies without having too many of those source problems. It's a um, the second one is that um, these days you don't only have a web app, but you might have a mobile app or a desktop app or even a CLI app and the web app. And the funny thing is that the session cookies, that's something that's inherent of the web. Only the web uses cookies, and mobile app is never going to use cookies. So, here we go. No. Now we're happy. Um, are we okay or not? Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> Let's see if we can get to the slides. Can you make the air touch? Uh, wait. If we can get to my yeah. presentation. Here we, we go. Okay. I'm not going to touch anything, so we'll keep the tabs and everything on top. Um, but we have some slides. And now, yes. Okay, so I introduce myself. I have cat stickers. If you want a cat sticker, just give me a picture of your cat, dog, bunny rabbit, doesn't matter. Um, I just like cat stickers, that's why. Um, so this is what we're going to see today, traditional authentication, what a token is, and token-based authentication. I already started introducing traditional authentication, so I'm just going to quickly skip over these. You authenticate with the server, you get your page back, and you get your cookie back. We talked about this, and you use that cookie every time you want to access a protected resource. Um, the difference is, a traditional architecture, browser, one server, can be multiple servers and servers, but it's usually one backend, let's say. Um, single page architecture, multiple APIs, this can be external APIs as well with all the different domains, different origins, um, different problems. Um, or you can have a multi-architecture, mobile app, desktop app, web app, stuff like this. Who's working or has worked on an application that's 
looks a bit like this, like more than one client. Okay, so as I've mentioned, cookies are web, but it would be nice if you could uh, maintain our sessions or state or authentication state in, a same way, in the same way for all of these clients, not just a cookie for web, something else for mobile, something else for desktop app. Um, so some of the, the problems with a traditional cookie-based approach, cookies don't like cores. So who likes cores? No one likes cores, right? If you have a course problem, what you do is you go to Google, you type in the course problem, go to Stack Overflow, and just read what's written on Stack Overflow. Um, cookies also don't, don't, don't like cores because a cookie is issued by an origin, by a domain, um, and they don't like it if you try to do fancy stuff with that. Cookies also require state, because most of the time a session cookie um, contains a session ID, which is something you save in a database with some other um, attributes, like an expiry date, for example. So you need to keep a database with state for your, for your sessions. And cookies don't flow. You cannot pass a cookie issued by one, one domain, one server, to another one. That's not possible, in theory. Um, so they don't flow between multiple services. Um, like, for example, if your main API issues a cookie and another of your APIs wants to use the same ID session in that cookie, they don't just magically flow from one to another, or they're not usable by one and the other. Um, so what's the solution? Maybe it's token-based authentication. We'll see later in this talk. I think it might be. Um, but first, I need to tell you what a token is, because talking about token-based authentication without explaining what a token is doesn't really make that much sense. So to me, a token is a unique identifier representing something. And this can be anything. It can represent some, uh, some identity. It can re represent some permissions to access certain API endpoints or scopes within your API. It's just something you take, and based on, of, on this token, you can get some meaning. Um, there are different kinds of tokens. An access token. Who's ever used an access token before? Who's ever used an ID token before? A few less hands. Refresh tokens. You should never use them. Um, <laughs> we'll talk about them later. You can always use them, but not with single page applications most of the time. Um, we'll see what they are later. Um, but these are a few different kinds of tokens that are commonly used on the internet. I think right um, And they're often an, an opaque string in the form of a unique ID, which means they're a unique ID, a unique identifier that you save in the database um, with some extra attributes. Um, but they don't have to be. They can also be XML. If you use SAML, for example, your token is going to be an XML file or an XML blob with some information inside of it, and it's perfectly valid as a token because based on this XML block, you can get some other meaning. Um, and it can also be JSON out tokens because XML is a bit dated. We like JSON on the web these days, um, so we came up, or they came up with a standard called JSON out tokens, um, which we use as much as possible at all zero, just because we really believe in them, we think they're really useful, um, so we try to use them as much as possible. <coughs> and this is a JSON web token. If you've never seen a JSON web token before, it might seem like a bit of random characters, which they are not. Um, but if you look a bit closer, you might see that they're also built out of three different parts, right? You have two dots, one um, after the red part and one after the purple part. So JSON web token is always made out of three different parts. Who's ever noticed this before? Three people, perfect. Um, so to get started, the first part of the JSON web token is called the header. And what this is, is basically just a basic form encoded JSON object, which contains some more information about the token itself. The type, it's a JSON token. The algorithm that has been used to sign the token is HS256 in this example. So it's just a basic C4 of a JSON object. The same is true for the payload, the middle part. Um, it's just a basic C4 of another um, JSON object, which might look like this. Um, but there's a bunch of different things you can put in there. Um, but if you decode it, you would be able to see something like a subject. It's usually a user ID, your given name or family name, um, when it's issued at, so it depends them, and also when it expires. So a JSON web token can have its own expiry date inside of it, so you don't need to store this somewhere separately in the back end. And that's one of the strengths. A JSON web token contains all the information you need to verify or you need to use a token inside of it. Um, and a payload can be anything as long as it's valid JSON. And there's a bunch of different claims. A claim is a key value pair inside of this JSON object. And the first one are reserved claims. These are claims that are specified by the, uh, by the spec, um, like subject, issuer, um, issue that date, expired date, there's a few more. But these are just specified by the spec. The second one are public claims. Um, and these are just claims that are not really specified by the spec, 
but there's this institute called IANA, which is a, an organization that stands that strives for some um, operability on the web, so a bit of that make sure that everything stays the same, and they have a whole list of claims that you can use for interoperability. So if you have an API and you have an API, you would use the same claims for, let's say, a first name, which is a given name, not a first name, for example, or a family name, which is not a family name, but I forgot what. And I was going to show you the list, but I cannot touch my laptop, so <laughs> we'll go on. But it's good to know that IANA, some uh, government, or it's not the government, some organization on the internet has a list of claims that help you standardize APIs across organizations. Um, and the last one, oh, I made videos before because I knew there would be some problems. This is a list like family name, middle name, nickname. These are all um, standardized claims you can use, um, standardized by the IANA. You don't have to, but it's better if you do. Um, and then the last one are private claims, and that's basically anything you want to have inside of your JSON up token, and which is useful in the use case for you. Um, it's base 64, so don't put anything sensitive in there, don't put credit card numbers in there or something because everybody can go to base 64 generator.com or whatever, paste them in and see what, what's inside of them. Um, but as long as it felt JSON, you can put it in there if it's of use to you. The longer you make your, your JSON, the longer your token will get and you have to send it with every request to a protected endpoint. So this will take up some bandwidth, so just put it there you know, inside of it. Um, and then the last part is a signature. And this means that um, we take our header and our payload, or the basically for our header and our payload, and run a signing algorithm. In this case, we use the HMAC SHA-256, whatever you want to pronounce it. Um, give the header and the payload and a common secret, um, and this will generate a signature. This means that if you want to change something in the header or the payload, you'll have to generate a new signature. If you would do that without a new signature, the signature would not match, and the JSON web token would not be valid. So JSON that token can be verified based on the signature. So if some hacker would try to intercept your token, change something in the payload, but not change the signature, you would, be, you would know that something has changed um, and that it's not okay to accept this token anymore. Um, so JSON that tokens can be verified. Some real world examples because the token is a bit abstract and we've seen before that there's multiple tokens like an access token which most of you already have used in the past. In the form of a JSON app token, it might look something like this. It has the issuer and the subject, the user ID, the audience, so for which API it's intended. Um, issue that and expiry dates and some scopes as well. So um, access tokens don't have to be JSON app tokens, they can be anything. But if you use a JSON app token, you can already include a lot of information about the uh, access you grant to your API inside of the token, which can be useful. Another example is an ID token, and an ID token um, is going to contain a bit of information about the identity of the person who uh, authenticated. And this is, like you can see, a lot of more personal information, nickname, name, your uh, user profile, whatever you want, and again, an expiry date and issue date because they just want to have inside of your token. We've seen some signatures based on a symmetrical al algorithm, which means you have a shared secret and the secret is used to either gen generate a new signature or verify the signature. There's also asymmetrical algorithms, which use a private key to generate the signature and a public key to verify the signature. Um, it's a bit more secure. Um, this also means that you can share the public keys to everybody that needs them um, without being at any risk that they can generate a new signature because you need a private key for that. There's a bunch of them listed here on the bottom. And if you want to share them, there's a bunch of different ways. And one of them is using a JWK, a JSON web key. So you have a JSON web token, a JSON web key. And again, it's some JSON which contains some public key information. You can take this to verify any um, JSON web token that has been issued with the private key belonging to this public key. Um, and they're often set, shared under the .wellknown slash OpenID configuration. Um, it's a route if you use OpenID Connect that is public on the authorization server. If you would go to that, you have a whole list of um, information about the um, configuration, configuration, and one of them is JWKS URI. And on this URI, you can find all the, the public keys that are being used, or you can use to verify JSON web tokens uh, generated by this authorization server. It's often JWKS.json. So let's make a little comparison. On the right, you have a Belgian passport in four languages because we like to make it a bit difficult sometimes. Um, 
and on the left you have a header of a JSONOP token. And what this passport says is, I'm a passport by the Kingdom of Belgium from the European Union. It basically says what it is, and that's the same for JSONOP token header. It says what it is. I'm a JSONOP token, and I'm signed with this algorithm. If you open the passport, there's some information about me, my name, my photo, the expiry date of this passport. Same thing can be for a payload of a JSONOP token. Contains some information about the consumer of this token if it's an API. It's more scopes and, and permissions. If it's um, an ID token, it's more information about the identity of the person that authenticated and the expiry date again. And then every passport has some protection measurements in place, like UV hologram thingies, and a JSONOP token as a signature. So let's see it in action. We have this little web app here, which shows you random dog pictures. Um, but apart from dog pictures, it also has a button to show you cat pictures. But we all know cats. Cats are a bit more difficult than dogs, so you need to authenticate to actually see the dogs, the cats. To authenticate, we use Google and Auth0 for this. Um, and once we authenticate it, we can get cat pictures. So we got an access token, which we could use to send to our API. But we also see that on the right corner we have already some information about me, my photo, my username. That's because we don't, didn't only get an access token back, but also an ID token. And as we've seen before, an ID token contains information about the identity of the person that just authenticated. So without doing an extra request, we have some information we can show already in our web app about the identity, me, the person who logged in, um, which is nice. It's convenient. It, from an API stand of view, we have three um, endpoints, post, one post to an authentication request with some legal and passport, passwords, don't use it as a password, but you get back a JSONOP token, then a public dog endpoint, and a private cats one. So if you would not send a JSONOP token together to, to this endpoint, we'd get no author authorization token was found, but if you would use one, we'd get a cat picture. Um, but then one of the strengths of JSONOP tokens is that they contain a lot of information inside of them. So if you would use a token that has an expiry date that's in the past, so that's expired, your middleware would immediately see, oh, this token is not valid anymore, so I will not accept it anymore. The same thing goes for some token that of which the payload has been changed, so the signature doesn't match. Your middleware will see that this has an invalid signature and it will not accept this token. So without doing a lot of things in the back end, just by looking inside of the token and verifying the signature, you can already um, accept or decline the tokens in a lot of instances. If you want to know more, there's json.token.io. It contains a little debugger which you can use to create or debug um, the code json.tokens. tokens. We don't send this to any backend, we don't save those tokens, it's all done on the front end, just as a disclaimer. And it also contains a whole list of libraries that help you use json.tokens tokens in the most common languages and frameworks. Um, so json.token.io if you want to know more about them. Um, so are there some downsides to JSON of tokens? Yes, there are. <laughs> Invalidation of tokens is a bit harder because a JSON of token contains all the information inside of it. Once it has been issued, it stands on its own, right? It, it still contains expiry date and signature and all the information inside of it, the audience for which API it has been used. So if you want to revoke it, you have to use something like a blacklist or a whitelist so you can check your token against those lists before or after you validate the token itself. Um, and if you leak your secrets or public keys, it's also a bit annoying. That's why I call secret and private keys. Public keys you can leak those in there. Um, and don't put sensitive data in your JSON Web Token, uh, because we've seen it's just base 64. So, I don't have that much time, so quickly token based authentication. Same scenario, user browser and web server. User authenticates with the web server, um, but instead of getting a cookie back, we get an access token back, and we'll use this access token for all the next requests um, that we need to um, authenticate with all the next protected requests. Um, I'm just going to keep on talking because the screen is not working anymore, it's flickering. Um, oh no, not yet. Um, so we have this access token, which we use instead of the session cookie. Uh, we send it with every request that needs authentication and authorization. Um, and I forgot what was next. Oh, OAuth. Who's used OAuth before? Most of you. Okay. Um, the next slide would tell me what OAuth is exactly. And it says, OAuth 2.0 is a protocol that allows a user to grant limited access to their resources. So OAuth is a protocol, a framework used to, use to grant limited access. It's not meant for authentication. So if you want to do a token-based authentication, you'll need something like OpenID Connect. 
Um, and who's used OpenID Connect before? Just a few people. I think more of you might have used it without realizing because OpenID Connect is basically you take OAuth and everything inside of OAuth, but you add an identity layer on top, which means the ID token, basically. So it's OAuth plus identity. Um, like you see, OIDC, OpenID Connect was created as an identity layer for OAuth 2.0. So if you want to do identity authentication with token-based token -based approach, you should actually use OpenID Connect instead of OAuth. Um, and it looks a bit like this. I split my authorization server from the rest of my API. You authenticate, get your token back, your access token. But you can also get an ID token back and a refresh token if you really want to. You save them somewhere in memory and use the access token as before just to access your API. Um, but this is using the OAuth implicit flow, and since December, the IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force, has issued a new best practices document stating that you should stay away from the implicit flow if possible and go with the Pixie flow, which is um, authorization code with proof key for code exchange, short Pixie flow, because it's a bit more secure. The implicit flow is fine, and I think 99% of all the web apps, signal based applications use them. Um, but they also have some measurements in place to mitigate all the risks involved with the implicit flow. So you don't have to start changing all your applications, but if you build a new one, it might be good to look into the Pixie flow. Um, and what this, is, what this does is basically it sends a code challenge together with your credentials to your authorization server. You save this code challenge, send back a challenge from your authorization server. You're going to sign this in a certain way and send this, uh, this signed challenge together with the original challenge back to your authorization server by matching the initial code challenge and the signed challenge, you can verify that the client that initiated the, the first uh, request is also the same that, has, that gets access to the tokens later on. So it's two more steps, but it's a bit more secure. Um, and then you get your tokens back. Um, and what about refresh tokens and single page applications? Because I'm not going to talk about them, except this. Using refresh tokens in, front end, in the front end should be avoided unless you have refresh token rotation in place, which almost nobody has, but if you have it, very good. Um, or you use sender constraints. And this is something that sounds very good in theory, but it's not possible in practice on the web yet. So there's a lot of clever people thinking about how to do this. So sender constraint is not really possible. Token rotation is. This means that you rotate your refresh tokens on a regular basis. If they get stolen, if they get leaked, they will not be valid for too long, so it's a bit less of a risk. Um, but if you don't have any of those two systems in place, try to avoid refresh tokens um, and use silent authentication in the bank um, if you want to uh, renew tokens. So, does this evolve this approach solve for course? I think it does. I think it does. Because a token is not issued by an origin, it's not issued by a domain, it's just something that stands on its own, and as long as you know how to validate the token, anybody can use it. Um, there's often still an audience in them, so it's still intended for certain domains or certain APIs, but as long as you are in the audience, you can validate them, you can use them, so it's a bit agnostic of which domain or origin it comes from. Does, it, does this approach solve flow? Can you pass one token from one server to the other? Who thinks it does? Some black people? And again, if you know how to validate them, Sure, you can pass them along from one API to the other. There's some, it's not really best practice, and usually you go to a token exchange endpoint to get a new token instead, but it's possible. Um, and does this approach solve keeping states? Who thinks it does? And you're kind of right, because in theory it contains all the information inside of it, but if you want to keep a blacklist, for example, to um, invalidate tokens, you're back to state. If you want to do silent authentication, which I didn't talk about because of time constraints, We'll have to issue some session cookies again, and you need some state. So in theory, you can do stateless authentication with JSON app tokens, um, but in practice, often you still need a bit of state. So let's summarize. Using session cookies is hard with single-page applications, because often are uh, course problems and some other things. Um, stateless authentication is possible in theory. In practice, usually you have a little bit of state. And JSON app tokens consist out of three parts, the header, the payload, and the signature. I have a bunch of links here on the screen. Um, if you want to know more, jsonaptoken.io. Uh, my blog has a really interesting article about <laughs> why the, you should uh, stay away from the implicit flow and go to the pixie flow. I'll share these slides later as well, so don't worry. Um, it's on there if you want to take a picture now. And our blog is <laughs> full with uh, <laughs> some other content as well. Um, so that's blog.alzero.com, I think, or alzero.com slash blog, one of those. Um, there you have it. <laughs>
you can find these slides at jwt.samega.tech. The ones on there currently are a bit longer than these ones, but everything I talked about is inside of those slides anyway. Um, so that's jwt.samega.tech. I will tweet them later as well, um, because the big naked picture is hard. And lastly, there's a thank you. So thank you for listening and sorry for